Good evening, Starville Church. It is the middle of the week, and it's time for us to have Wednesday evening service. We're glad that we have the ability to do this, even though we're not together in person. The Lord wants us to be together in watching this and then sharing the same truths together. So let's go to the Lord in prayer tonight. Invite him to where we're at, whether you're at home or you're traveling or you're looking on your phone or on your television, just that the Lord will come and speak to our hearts tonight. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we invite you to this place tonight. Would you fill this place with your presence? Lord, as we sing, as we pray, as we hear your words, may we respond to what you're saying and the work you want to do in our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Good evening, everyone. Let us sing together. Let us rejoice. Praise you, the Lord. Sing a new song. Dance before our King. With the high praises of God in our mouths, our lives to you we bring. Let us rejoice. Rejoice in our King. Let us rejoice. Shout and his name above all days, or let all that his praises ring. Praise ye the Lord, sing a new song, dance before our King. With the high praises of God in our mouth, our lives to you we bring. Let us rejoice, rejoice in our King, let us rejoice. Apart from his command, and what will keep us to the end? The love of Christ in which we stand. Oh, sing hallelujah, our hope springs eternal. Oh, sing hallelujah. Christ our hope in life and death. What truth can calm the troubled soul? God is good, God is good. Where is His grace and goodness known? In our great Redeemer's blood, who holds our faith when fears arise, who stands above who sends the waves that bring us nigh unto the shore, the rock of Christ. Oh, sing hallelujah, our hope springs eternal. Oh, sing hallelujah, now and ever we confess. Christ our hope. 
hope in life and death. Unto the grave, what shall we sing? Christ, he lives, Christ, he lives. And what reward will heaven bring? Everlasting life with him. the Lord, when sin and death will be destroyed, and we will feast on endless joy, when Christ is ours forevermore. Oh, sing hallelujah, our hope springs eternal. salvation has come, yet by your sufferings our freedom is won. For God has highly exalted your name, he has enthroned you on
Lord, we thank you for today and your many wonderful blessings. We just pray you'd be here now. Lord, we just pray that you're, uh, you'd be with the word. Lord, that it would uh, touch us, that it would speak to us, that it would make us to be more like you. Lord, we just also pray that you'd be with everyone in our, in our family, in our church body. Lord, those who need healing, would you just touch them? Would your spirit be with them? Lord, in all of our decisions and all the other aspects of life, would we just learn to seek you and to know you, Lord, to know your heart and uh, your best for us. Lord, we just pray you'd be here now in your precious name. Amen. Welcome to What the Bible Says About Obadiah. We've been looking at various prophets, and Obadiah is one of the shortest books in the Bible with only 21 verses. So that means it's grouped with the minor prophets. So verse 1 starts with the words, the vision of Obadiah. So Obadiah received a vision from God and wrote about it. Some people are very visual learners. They are observant and see everything. There are other kinds of learners, auditory. They learn by listening. Kinesthetic learners are very hands-on learners. We're all made very differently for different purposes. I rarely have dreams when I sleep, let alone have a vision. I'm not very visual, but it seems Obadiah was a visual learner. He could picture things and see things in his mind's eye. So God used a vision to speak to Obadiah. His name means servant of the Lord. We don't really know anything else about him as a person, but we know he served the Lord and received a vision from God. So we will just look at the message of the vision God gave him. Obadiah starts with, thus says the Lord God concerning Edom. So that poses the question, who is Edom? We know the brothers Jacob and Esau, the twin sons of Isaac and Rebekah. Jacob had a name changed to Israel and eventually his descendants were called the Israelites. Esau was also called Edom and eventually his descendants were called the Edomites. So this small book of Obadiah is a vision given to him for the Edomites. The people grew descended from Esau. The first section of the book is titled, Edom Will Be Humbled. This section teaches us humility is a perspective. The second section is titled, Edom's Violence Against Jacob, teaching us that hatred is destructive. The last part of the book of Obadiah is the declaration of judgment on Edom. This judgment had to come because of the hatred Edom had for his brothers. The third takeaway for us in this small book is God wants restoration in relationships. We will start with humility is a perspective. The Edomites had become a proud and arrogant people. They settled on high ground called Mount Esau. They felt secure with the protection of being high in the mountains. They looked down on others, which goes hand in hand with being proud. Their perspective was they were too strong to fail. We read in verses two through four, God declaring, he will bring them down. God would humble them. Verse two starts with, behold, I will make you small among the nations. You shall be utterly despised. The pride of your heart has deceived you. You who live in the clefts of the rock, in your lofty dwelling, who say in your heart, who will bring me down to the ground? Though you soar aloft like the eagle, though your nest is set among the stars, from there I will bring you down, declares the Lord. God declared that although they thought they were invincible, God was going to bring their pride down. As a nation, we would be wise to take heed to this warning. If a nation thinks it's too strong to fail, the Lord is able to bring down that pride. We also want to take personal warning from the Edomites. As Christians, we want to understand that recognizing our weakness is our strength, that humbling ourselves is how the Lord can lift us up. Remember Paul, he had a thorn in the flesh. Not exactly sure what that meant, but what was his attitude? So let's read Paul's words in 2 Corinthians 12. So to keep me from becoming conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from becoming conceited. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, 
I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Wow, it is this perspective that demonstrates Paul's humility. Paul recognized that the hardships and calamities were there to make him aware of his need for Christ. He even said he was content with all these difficult things. He knew they were there to make him aware of his weaknesses and draw from the Lord's strength. Humility is this perspective. It is in recognizing our frailty so we can see God come through for us. If we are proud like the Edomites and rely on our own strength, God may bring circumstances to humble us. Certainly these last 18 months have brought various hardships to many of us. Many have faced health issues. Many face difficult family situations they're working through. In many ways, we have been in a wilderness. My prayer has been that we will come out of the wilderness leaning upon our beloved, as it says in Song of Solomon. Galatians 6, 3 says, For if anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. James 4.10 says, Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will exalt you. Humility is the perspective of recognizing we are nothing, we are weak and frail, and we need the strength of the Lord to be our portion. Humility is the perspective of recognizing the Lord God is the Most High over all the earth, and he is sovereign. Isaiah saw the Lord sitting upon a throne high and lifted up. It was this experience that caused Isaiah to recognize his need for cleansing. Isaiah's perspective of humility was the opposite of the proud Edomites. Proverbs, Proverbs 16 says, Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. It is better to be of a lowly spirit with the poor than to divide the spoil with the proud. This proverb says pride goes before destruction, and we see this illustrated in the Edomites. The second section of the book of Obadiah is titled Edom's Violence Against Jacob. We see the pride of the Edomites led to hatred, violence, and destruction. As the end of this proverb said, they divided the spoil with the proud, the Edomites actually banned with the enemies of the people of God. One theory is that Obadiah wrote the book during the Philistine and Arabian invasions of Jerusalem, and the Edomites basically rejoiced in seeing the destruction and even joined in. Their hatred was brought out in violence. Obadiah says in verses 11 and 12, Because of the violence done to your brother Jacob, shame shall cover you. You shall be cut off forever. On the day that you stood aloof, on the day that strangers carried off his wealth and foreigners entered his gates and cast lots for Jerusalem, you were like one of them. We see here, hatred is destructive. If you remember, these twin brothers had conflict from the womb. Then as grown men, when Esau was famished, he wanted Jacob's stew. Jacob offered the stew in exchange for Esau's birthright. Esau agreed. This meant that Esau would give up his birthright to be recognized as the firstborn just for a bowl of stew. This implies Esau was very short-sighted. He was living only for the moment and not looking to the future. Jacob, on the other hand, asking for the birthright implies he did think about the future. He even deceived his father with his mother's help, of course, to steal Esau's blessing as their father was dying. Deceiving is not right and being deceived hurts, but responding in hatred is only destructive for all involved. Genesis 27 tells this story and verse 41 tells Esau's response to Jacob's deception. Now Esau hated Jacob because of the blessing with which his father had blessed him. And Esau said to himself, the days of mourning for my father are approaching. Then I will kill my brother Jacob. Esau hated Jacob, and it was passed down to his descendants, the Edomites. So here we are, generations later in Obadiah's day, and we see hatred is destructive. And God commands this to stop, or judgment would come. The next verses say, But do not gloat over the day of your brother in the day of his misfortune. Do not rejoice over the people of Judah in the day of their ruin. Do not boast in the day of distress. 
Do not enter the gate of my people in the day of their calamity. Do not gloat over his disaster in the day of his calamity. Do not loot his wealth in the day of his calamity. Edom was judged for what they did to Israel. Verse 15 says, For the day of the Lord is near upon all the nations. As you have done, it shall be done to you. Your deeds shall return on your own head. God always sent prophets to warn people of judgment. As we saw in the book of Joel, God is merciful and kind. His heart is that people would turn to him, that people would understand his love and call upon his name. But when the creation refuses to respond to their creator, his judgment does come eventually, whether we see it with our own eyes or not. Either way, everyone's final judgment is when we pass into eternity. That is why we need to avoid Esau's example of pride and hatred. It is interesting that early on through Moses, God commands the descendants of Jacob to not despise the Edomites. We read this in Deuteronomy 23, verse 7. You shall not abhor an Edomite, for he is your brother. We see God commanded the Israelites to have brotherly love for the Edomites. The Edomites were relatives. They were the descendants of his brother Esau. And who do we have the most conflict with? Those closest to us, right? And perhaps especially our relatives. So God warned Jacob not to abhor an Edomite. God knew the Edomites would mistreat God's people. But God warns his people, do not abhor them. Other versions say, do not despise them or do not detest them. Why? Because God knows how dangerous and harmful hatred is. God knows if hatred grows, it causes destruction, just as it eventually did with Edom and his descendants. They not only caused harm and destruction for the Israelites, but eventually they were destroyed also. History tells us that the Edomites ceased to exist after the fall of Jerusalem in 70 AD. Think of how Jesus told us that the two most important commandments are to love God and love your neighbor. You've probably heard me say it before at one time or another. If we can do these two things, love God with all our heart and love our neighbor as ourselves, then we have it all figured out. Let's read in Galatians chapter 5 where Paul goes so, as so far as to say the whole law is fulfilled if you love your neighbor. For you were called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, watch out that you are not consumed by one another. So hatred is destructive. God knows this and understands this since he created us. So God wants restoration in relationships. Here are two very serious passages about this final thought. 1 John chapter 3. For this is the message that you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. We should not be like Cain, who was of the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own deeds were evil and his brother's righteous. Do not be surprised, brother, brothers, that the world hates you. We know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brothers. Whoever does not love abides in death. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. Very serious words. And then in Matthew chapter 5, Jesus said, You have heard that it was said to those of old, You shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. And whoever says you fool will be liable to the hell of fire. So if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. We know God is love, and as we draw near to God, we can learn to love others. For God so loved the world that he gave us Jesus to show us the way, the truth, and the life. The Holy Spirit is available to guide us and to help us learn to love our neighbor. In particular, 
I believe God wants restoration in marriages and the day we are living. There's such attack against God's intended plan for marriage. God calls the church his bride. Jesus is the bridegroom. So marriage is a particularly important relationship. It is a covenant relationship that is not to be broken because our relationship with Christ is not to be broken. It seems the enemy of our soul is out to destroy marriages because marriage represents Christ and the church. Those that are married need to guard your relationship. By God's grace, don't let hardness of heart enter your marriage. God's ways are right, and the sooner we learn that, the better off we are in life and in relationships. In our Connect class, the young ones recently learned that God is righteous because he always does what is right. Their memory verse was Psalm 119, 137 that says, Righteous are you, O Lord, and right are your rules. God makes the rules for life and for relationships. He gave us the rule book, the Bible. Our relationships work well as we accept that and submit to his rules. So just in review, the message of Obadiah's vision. Humility is a perspective. The perspective that God is the Almighty and is sovereign and his strength is made perfect in our weakness. Hatred is destructive. In the end, hatred separates us from God and destroys others as well as our relationship with God. Restoration in relationships is God's desire. Jesus wants us to live out brotherly love. It may take a lifetime to learn how to love, but that is God's goal. May we receive grace and mercy to understand how awesome God is and to love him with all our hearts and to love our neighbor. Amen. Thank you, Val, for that message on Obadiah. And just those two points that Val brought up at the end. You know, God is able to bring down pride. He's able to deal with those issues in our hearts. And we want to allow him to do that. Strength comes when we realize our own weaknesses and rely on God's abilities. And that's our real strength. It's not in what we can do but in what he can do. And just that second one, that concept that God wants to deal with hatred and contention with that's going on inside of us and towards those that we're close to. He wants us to love our neighbor in the end. Love and reconciliation is necessary if we're going to go on with the Lord. So the Lord wants to deal with these issues in our hearts. You know, uh, the, the story that... The prophecy that was given out was given to a nation that no longer exists. They were unwilling to allow the Lord's change to happen in their life. We want to allow the Lord to come and to touch us deep, deeply, to deal with pride, to deal with hatred and contention, that we would be closer to him and closer to each other. Let's go to him in prayer tonight. Lord, we're thankful for this message tonight. Lord, I feel you're speaking to us. Lord, in, in these areas, would you move in us? Lord, you want to deal with pride. Lord, that we would see our true weakness and our ability only comes by getting grace from you to do what we can't. But Lord, also this hatred and contention that we can find ourselves embracing at times. Lord, we ask that you would deal with that in our hearts. Lord, that your love, that reconciliation would come to our hearts so we could share it with others. We thank you. Lord, we ask that you'd be with us the rest of this week. We're your people as we pursue you. Lord, may you bless us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.